This district, right here, has been my home more than any other area I've ever lived in my life. They thought they could beat him. I wasn't as concerned as, as I should have been. I was very confident. I didn't, I didn't count on Clem. He was a very conservative, right-wing, hard-hitting editorial writer. I made the great mistake of thinking you didn't have to defend yourself. I never recall him really substantively answering the charges. I think he tried to ignore them. I can't recall John responding to it, and I think if he had, it could have made a difference. Hi, I'm Chris Egan. In 1972, John Kerry tried to win his first political office here in Massachusetts' 5th District. The district was comprised of several liberal communities and two hard-scrabbled cities, Lawrence and Lowell. John wanted to springboard his campaign to success by using his notoriety as a leader of the anti-Vietnam War movement. But what he received was some very valuable political lessons right here in Lowell. As John Kerry zeroes into his White House dream, his most valuable political lesson is still fresh in his mind. In the first race I ever ran, uh, I came under withering attack. And it was the first time that sort of negative advertising had taken place and even negative attacks from the newspaper. Uh, I made the great mistake of thinking you didn't have to defend yourself. Mm. I have learned now, and I will never, ever make that mistake again. And we saw Max Cleland suffer from the same thing. He regrets he didn't defend himself. We need all the help we can get. I believe in you. Thank you very, very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay. It was 1972, and John Kerry was running for the United States Congress. In six short months, this son of privilege, perceived by some as the darling of the liberal elite, got his political education. Kerry has referred to this campaign and its lessons often during his career. Current 5th District Congressman Marty Meehan recalls one such reference from Kerry after Meehan won the seat. I remember uh, being at a John Kerry fundraiser uh, after I had gotten elected to Congress and John introduced me to his father and he, he, he said to him, Dad, this is uh, Marty Meehan, he won the seat that, uh, that I couldn't win. And, uh, and I kind of laughed and his father laughed and he said, yeah, that was a tough campaign. This is the Des Moines Register Democratic presidential candidates debate. From that loss came great political lessons, which continue to serve Kerry today. Lessons unable to be taught in prestigious prep schools or renowned university, but from the gritty mill city of Lowell, Massachusetts. Today, Lowell is thriving, its old mill buildings retooled for high tech. But in 1972, Lowell was a decaying mill city where labor unions were born, where immigrants began their American dream, and where churches were the maypole those families and ethnic communities gathered round. They would steal, the, the right. kids in the house were stealing $400,000. It could not have been more foreign territory to John Kerry, shown here touring a drug rehabilitation facility with his first wife, Julia. Kerry had already tried on two other congressional districts for size before settling on Lowell's fifth. Absolutely. Where do you live? Right here? In Methuen. In Methuen? All right, I spoke up there just a little while ago. Yeah, I've been living here for well, It didn't take Kerry long to realize that, like a suitor, a candidate can never make the subject of their affections, political or romantic, feel like their second choice. Frank Phillips, now a Boston Globe reporter, covered the race for the Lowell Sun. Uh, John had uh, been around congressional districts. In 1970, he looked at the third district, which Father run and eventually won the nomination. He didn't run, but he was looking at it. He came up in 1970. The first time I met John Ker uh, Kerry was in May 1970. He came up and sat down with me and Ken Wallace. Uh, who was then the city editor of the, uh, of the uh, Lowell Sun. And we had, uh, in May 1970, and he essentially told us he was going to run for uh, Congress against Brad Morse. He uh, subsequently decided not to. He then uh, came back uh, and was going to run in Worcester, and, uh, and then came back uh, when Brad Morse dropped out of the race, came back to the 5th District. And so he well deserved a, um, a, 
a reputation that was, became known as Kerry, Kerry Mandarin. I'm not here as John Kerry. I'm here as one member of a group of 1,000, which is a small representation of a very much larger group of veterans in this country. And Awkwardness of entry aside, from a political perspective, John F. Kerry seemed to have it all. Both a war hero and a peace activist at a time when the country was split between hawks and doves. Each with his own ambitions, been lost for a policy that is now in doubt in minds all around the globe. He had the looks of a matinee idol at a time when television was shaping the public image of our political leaders, an educational pedigree well-heeled friends and family anxious to donate their money for a chance to have a seat at the political table. Most of all, John Kerry had that fire-in-the-belly quality great political leaders need to succeed. Where do we go? With the retirement of Republican Congressman F. Bradford Morse, in a district long overdue to become Democratic, Kerry had a place to strut his advantages. Kendall Wallace, now publisher of The Lowell Sun, was the city editor who directed the coverage of the 1972 Kerry campaign. Brad Morse was a very interesting character, grew up in Lowell, a family owned a uh, funeral home. Uh, he was an attorney. He was involved in a restructuring the city government after the last uh, strong mayor had gone to jail on uh, some uh, trumped up charges, I'm sure, uh, and created the Plan E form of government, city manager form of government, and was elected to the first uh, city council um, under that form of government. Um, served a couple of terms and then went back, went off to Washington, served in a number of roles in Washington. And in 1960, uh, Edith Norse Rogers, who had been our congressman since 1920s, um, died suddenly. Uh, he came back to Lowell, ran on stickers, and was elected to Congress. Kerry's lack of connection to the community would become a major part of the campaign as he dissed city politicians who had toiled in the local political vineyards, waiting for a chance to represent their hometown in Washington, D.C. I think that he didn't do as good a job as he should have of establishing relationships with the other candidates so he could get all the candidates behind him after this race. You know, in these days, candidates, they didn't run all these negative ads that you see today. It was still possible to get out of a campaign not having really mentioned your opponent. This was a crowded Democratic field, and I think that John learned that, uh, that, that it was probably more important to, if you're going to win the race, to keep the various candidates, keep a relationship with them so you could get them behind, behind you afterwards. Because I think if John had had all the candidates um, solidly behind him, that, uh, that he may have been able to win in 1972. So I think that's an another lesson uh, that he learned. Marie Sweeney, a Democratic activist, supports Kerry today but recalls her thoughts of his candidacy in 1972. I thought, oh, not a good idea. We have this concept of, uh, you know, blow-ins, and uh, 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 we're very harsh with them. Uh, you know, I think that the people in the area and the people in politics, not the, the voters and the politicians, think that they know what's best for Lowell or the greater Lowell or the 5th District, and they're not looking for somebody to, to come in. And so, although he was attractive and... Um, you know, he, he was very articulate, and he was coming off, uh, not even coming off, he was still involved in the anti-war, and certainly he was appealing, going to appeal to some of the towns out beyond Greater Lowell, but the people in Lowell, they had plenty of candidates. Uh, Excuse me, let, let me answer. Even before he was a candidate, Kerry had to defend himself against charges that he was an opportunist, here at a rather contentious meeting about prisoners of war. That's, that's, that's. What I am doing right now is political. What I have been involved in for the last year and a half is political. Whether I am going to be involved running for office or, or taking an appointed position or uh, working in movement politics or whatever, my commitment is to working towards social change and towards solving the problems that exist in this country. To John Kerry, a congressional seat would be an opportunity a good first step. To local Pauls, a seat in Congress would crown their career. Well, I was a city councilor at the time. I had got involved in politics, and uh, I saw this as an opportunity to uh, do better. And 
Bob Kennedy was one of 10 Democrats running for the seat. Tony DeFruscia, a 32-year-old state representative from Lawrence, Lowell's sister city in the Merrimack River Valley, was also a candidate. Well, it was a, an interesting opportunity. I'm being 32, a young whippersnapper in the Mass Legislature, and I thought it was an opportunity to go forward and politically because Brad Morse was no longer going to be the congressman. The front runner in the race, who would eventually finish second, was Lowell's Paul Sheehy. Well, in 1972, I was a member of the Massachusetts House of Representatives, and I was uh, interested in being a candidate for Congress, and it just so happened that uh, Brad Moss uh, wind up taking another path, and uh, the field then became open, and we had a barrel full of candidates. But that they're going to be the code by which we really live as a people. Thank you. It was that sense of entitlement that would be the legacy of the 1972 campaign, and the lessons learned by Kerry would become the legacy of his political life. Lessons that today have him within reach of the presidency of the United States. But few took him seriously in the 5th District, at first. I wasn't as concerned as, as I should have been, let's put it that way. I guess I, I wasn't shocked, or I, uh, it, it, uh, it didn't change my thinking on my ability to win the race. That I, I thought that uh, John uh, wasn't from the district, he didn't know the district, um, and uh, he'd have a hard job winning support within the base that I had established. That was my feeling. I was very confident. Well, at that time, I was uh, not so much surprised as disappointed. Uh, he had shown interest in several other districts. He certainly was a more highly visible public figure than a lot of us, even though we had been in office and he had not. I think it was uh, some sneering, uh, some contempt, um, but they thought they could beat him. Um, he was an outsider, what they call in Lowell a blow-in. Um, he uh, had no connections, no roots. Um, he came from a, a very elite um, background. During the campaign, Kerry must once again defend himself against charges that he was an opportunist. I considered several areas, no doubt about it. I'm not ducking that at all. Uh, I was very fortunate to be able to. I mean, people came to me from California and offered me five districts out there that were new. Uh, they tried to get me to run against Delaney in New York, against Rooney in New York. I turned them all down because Massachusetts is my home, because this is where I want to be. And, and that's why I made this decision, because this district right here has been my home more than any other area I've ever lived in my life. I grew up here as a kid. I lived in this district. Uh, I registered to vote in this district when I was 21. I left to fight in Vietnam from this district. I came back to, from Vietnam to this district. And, and it's just where I feel I can make the most significant contribution. Along with the nuances of Lowell, there was also Clem Costello, a character who would loom large in this campaign. He's pictured here with former Massachusetts Governor Ed King in 1982. As editor of the Lowell Sun, he had no love for the anti-war message of John Kerry. Of course, describing Clem Costello and his political impact, even 30 years later, is not easy. I could go on forever about stories about Clem Costello. He was quite a character. The family had owned the paper for 100 years. He had been editor of the paper for probably since 1956. Um, he was a very conservative, uh, right-wing, uh, hard-hitting um, editorial writer. Clem was a uh, Republican, a Nixon Republican. Felt very strongly. He was very pro-war. Um, he uh, obviously disagreed very strongly with what Kerry was doing, despite, uh, and I don't, I, I think he just felt that Kerry had, uh, you know, was violating the most uh, patriotic uh, tenets here that went, he came out and protested against the war despite any kind of war background he had, and he resented it deeply. Costello and the anti-Kerry forces were quick to point out any examples of Kerry's lack of connection to the people of the 5th District. In 1972, the, the, the reporting requirements weren't quite what they were today. This is pre-Watergate, but um, I did look at the uh, reports, and, and it was quite clear that uh, he was getting money uh, at New York uh, Fifth Avenue apartment parties, uh, Otto Preminger and George Plimpton and, and people from Hollywood and, and, and Fifth Avenue were 
giving a lot of money to John Kerry. He was, uh, in 1972, had made a, a splash nationally when he gave that speech in 1971 before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. So people, people knew him. Even Kerry's decision to purchase a home in the district backfired on him when the price was trumpeted on the front page of The Sun. Well, that happened, um, as I remember, in the last week or 10 days of the campaign, that news came out that he bought a house for 50000 or 100000 which was, a, in those days, astoundingly high. He has a $100,000 house. Keep in mind, there was high, high unemployment. People weren't working. And to read all of a sudden that a beautiful home in the fashionable section of law was sold uh, for that kind of money, I'm not so sure there was a, that that was a benefit to his campaign. Well, it, it just fed all of the image that he was uh, an opportunist uh, and uh, a very wealthy opportunist at that. Then, only hours before people went to the polls, an event that is still political legend. John Kerry's brother Cam and another campaign worker were arrested. In the middle of the Watergate national controversy, uh, we have this same kind of situation here where uh, Cameron Kerry... Um, who was one of his brother's leading campaign workers, and Tom Vallely, who was his campaign manager, were arrested by the police at 2 o'clock in the morning, broke, breaking into the headquarters of one of his uh, chief opponents, uh, Tony DeFruscia, and it uh, naturally got huge, huge press here. In fact, I was with uh, Cam Carey and Tom Vallely about an hour before all this, one ha this happened, um, having a drink. They were talking about primary day, and this was Sunday night, and uh, before the primary, they were talking about their, how they're going to get the votes out, and they were outlining it uh, to me. And um, the, I left, went home, came in the next day, and I heard about this break-in um, and went over and covered this story. And I think our headline that day compared it to Lowell's Watergate uh, involving Kerry's brother. With the election so close, some political observers think voters didn't have the time to include the incident in their decision-making process, at least for the primary. Well, it was really a tempest in a teapot. There was not much to it. Efforts were made to make it look like it was a big deal, you know, a la Watergate, that kind of thing. It, it really was not much of an issue in the campaign. I think Tony DeFruscia tried to make it one, but... Uh, uh, I don't think it really meant anything. I think they were doing, uh, actually nosing around and spying, among other things. I mean, I had my phone lines in the same location. I'm not sure they'd go so far as to, as to cut the wires. Uh, their explanation was that they thought, we want to cut the wires. Now, that's ridiculous uh, for many reasons. We had only one person at the Lowell headquarters, and that person would be the chief suspect. Uh, my other thought was, obviously, that they were there because they may have received an anonymous tip. That's their story. Uh, I don't believe that for a minute, although years later I found out that somebody from another camp may have dropped that story to them. I take their story at face value, uh, and I spent a lot of time looking at this after the election particularly. Very good. What is that? Where'd you get that? That's yeah. peace and love. <laughs> <laughs> it's her That's birthday, nice. John. Despite these problems, Kerry had his advantages. With the field split in the urban areas, Kerry concentrated in the Tony suburbs outside of Greater Lowell, areas his opponents did not take seriously. I don't think they con took into consideration that there was a good part of the rest of the district there, um, that other voters in Concord, Lexington, and some of the, these suburban communities uh, would be a base, a political base, and turn out to be a very strong political base for John Kerry. The Kerry campaign was a very sophisticated campaign, and again, I have a very close friend who was very involved. They were identifying their vote in a way that no congressional race in Massachusetts had ever done. Everything that happened in that campaign was a first. It was the largest uh, fundraising effort of, of any campaign at that point in the history of the country. Uh, they were all, and keep in mind, computers weren't very well known in 1972. Mm -hmm. and, but the sophistication of phone banking, the sophistication of the advertising, the sophistication of the, all of the techniques of the campaign were far advanced to anything that people saw uh, any, anywhere else in the country. They were calling every single person a Democratic voter, likely Democratic voter, and asking them which issues they cared about the most. And if it were education, they'd send them John Kerry's position on education. If it were health care, they'd send them John Kerry's position on health care. If it were the war, they'd send them John Kerry's position on the war. Then they would call everyone back and say, did you get 
the information uh, that we sent you, and uh, now have you decided to vote for John Kerry? And they would mark every single person who is likely to vote in a system that would guarantee that they would get out their vote on Election Day. With these advantages and the largest political war chest in the nation that year, John Kerry became the Democratic nominee, the first real Democrat to have a chance for victory for almost a century. Frank Phillips is the person with arguably the best perspective on the race. Not only did he cover it, but within his family, he garnered some insight. As a disclaimer, I can tell you a little on the precinct level. My wife, to my chagrin, and I tried to hide it from everybody, was a precinct captain for uh, John Kerry and Concord and had a Kerry sticker on her car, which I avoided driving during the campaign. So Frank Phillips, who saw at home the sophisticated Kerry campaign, was one of the few who thought Kerry would win. I thought he was going to win the general election, too, so I was wrong there. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't count on Clem. Clem Costello was an old-fashioned newspaper man who used the paper to try to influence the election. He endorsed Kerry's Republican challenger, Paul Cronin, and attacked Kerry mercilessly in a series of front-page editorials. Clement Costello was very uh, uh, involved in these. He always would write fiery editorials and uh, with colorful cartoons, and uh, he was a very colorful, uh, colorful guy. A good newspaper person too. I mean, his uh, Clement had tr tremendous respect for the news hall. Uh, so you'd see Frank Phillips write a very favorable story about John Kerry uh, on the front page of the paper, but then you'd see the editorial that would absolutely be blasting. Uh, John Kerry. He wanted clean government, and he used his newspaper to pursue those goals. Uh, he cleaned up Middlesex County. If anybody was responsible for uh, cleaning up what was then uh, a lot of people considered a cesspool of corruption, cronyism, and just uh, uh, waste, Clem Costello um, was singularly responsible for uh, electing a reform ticket led by Paul Songus in 1972. Um, in 1970, he, he elected a reform sheriff, John Buckley, a Republican, uh, because he galvanized the, the voters around the issues of reform and clean government and devoted the, 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 the resources of the newspaper to, uh, to do that. He put investigative reporters. We all went down and did stories about the corruption in county government. And that was Clem Costello, and to his credit. Costello was also a tad odd. Clem was fluent in French, spoke, smoked goulois, wore silk shirts that were open to his belly button as he walked through the uh, newsroom. He was a very intimidating figure. He would sit in his office and you'd go down to talk to him and he would, he would have papers all around him. And he would all of a sudden, you could hear him go <laughs> on the floor right in front of you. He did that one time in front of Mike Dukakis, and I've never, Mike Dukakis used to be a very articulate man. It's one of the few times I've ever seen Mike Dukakis caught up short when Clem asked him a question then spit into a piece of paper. Odd or not, no one doubted Clem Costello knew how to use his newspaper to get what he wanted. Despite his polish and crack political staff, Kerry left Costello's writing and ranting cartoons unanswered. I think he tried to ignore them. He did not respond to them. Uh, late in the campaign, he would start to bring some snarling back. But uh, um, when it was over, I think he realized that was his biggest mistake. I was a, a sophomore in high school looking to learn, but the editorials seemed to be every day. They were endless. They had colorful um, cartoons. Uh, everyone was talking about them. Everyone was reading them. And in those days, everybody read the paper. Um, and there, were no, there was really no other outlet uh, for people in Lowell to learn about the race and to learn about the news. So it had a tremendous impact. And I think in, in retrospect, I, I never recall him really substantively answering um, the charges. There are a lot of charges to answer. That would, that, that would have kept the campaign busy. When it was over, it wasn't even close. Lowell, Lawrence, and all but three of the 22 towns in the district went to Republican Paul Cronin by a comfortable nine-point margin, leaving John Kerry to pick up the pieces of a shattered political career. He was crushed in, the, in 1972. Afterwards, I mean, he was just despondent. So he knew um, his head was handed to him, and um, he knows he has to go out and fight. 
Kendall Wallace recalls the aftermath of the race. He invited Frank and I up to his home for dinner after the election. Uh, yes, we did. And we had, we had Franco-American spaghetti. Yes, it was. It was. Kendall has got a great uh, memory. Talked about the campaign and said how he had under, underestimated the power of the newspaper. He was talking about building a helicopter. I said, what, John? What are you doing <laughs> building a helicopter in his backyard? Well, it turned out to be a, a toy helicopter, but... Uh, he certainly did not come, you know, come to grips with the fact that there were other candidates that did rather well uh, in the primary, and uh, he wasn't able to put all of us together in one room and sit us down and, and talk it out. Uh, I think he was kind of stuck with the, uh, you know, the carpet bag or that kind of thing. I don't think there was a lot that he could have done about it. Uh, Paul Cronin had been thinking about running for Congress for many, many years. That was not a, a um, decision that just happened like that. He had thought about it and prepared and, and had contacts everywhere, and he ran a great campaign. In addition to that, he had the support of the two major newspapers in the district, which helped. You know, in retrospect, uh, John should have uh, been much more forceful in uh, his uh, response to the attacks of the uh, newspaper. Uh, that was an onslaught, I mean, some of it very unfair. And uh, I can't recall John responding to it. And I think if he had, it could have made a difference. I think 1972 was... Uh... The first uh, time, uh, it was a real crisis in his life, um, that he, uh, and he had to come away there with some very, very uh, learned experiences. Um, that w it was tough for him, but I think he learned. He has learned that you have to reach out, that you have to, you can see him now. He's reaching out to all of those uh, candidates that were in the primary with him. He's, he's working with Edwards, he's working with Dean, but not only the candidates themselves, he's gone right to their supporters and he's looking for them. He's uniting them. John Kerry's loss in the 5th District was a devastating blow to the young politician. It'd be 10 years before he'd seek political office again. During that time, he went to law school, became a prosecutor, and started a law firm. Then in 1982, he was elected Massachusetts Lieutenant Governor. Two years later, he was elected to the U.S. Senate. During that time, there were one or two tough re-election campaigns, but he always remembered the political lessons taught here in Lowell. Cultivate the media, listen to the community, but most importantly, don't leave any attack unanswered. I'm Chris Egan.